last week we had talked about how one of the highest funded startups 800 million dollar startups was started by Peter Raylan in 1997-98. So Peter Raylan is a good friend and in Silicon Valley and uh, he's an IIT Delhi graduate, he's a brilliant guy and uh, I'd invited him to my class in IIT Bombay to kind of explain how can you spend 800 million dollars and get go bankrupt in three years. That itself is a great story, that itself is an amazing story Clearly, he is an amazing engineer, CTO, kind of a genius level guy and uh, he's also a very good businessman actually and uh, you know, uh, to be able to convince investors in your idea to invest 800 million dollars is itself a tremendous capability, right, convincing capability. So I want you to watch this video. Uh, because you will see how uh, Peter Raylan's career path from being an engineer and being one of the top engineers at HP and Oracle where he was very innovative, developing new products, how he becomes, he comes up with this brilliant idea to start Webvan and you know, and then how he convinces investors to invest that money and then you know, as the company takes shape they make a lot of strategic mistakes in building the company and it's basically trying to build a company using a big company mindset for an entrepreneurial company because the problems of a big company are totally different than the problems of a startup. The problems of a big, of a big company are that they already know the market but they're just trying to serve it better, cheaper, faster everything that uh, you know Professor Parag says is not innovation, right? Big companies don't innovate, they just slightly improve things here and there, right? They fine tune things, so but they already know the market, it's maybe a two billion dollar market for Vodafone, it's like a twenty billion dollar market for uh, oil and petroleum products for Reliance uh, Petroleum, so you know they already have their market and they just have to grow it a little bit, little bit, little bit and they worry a lot about macro factors and things on microeconomic changes etc. But they don't have to figure out if the market exists, if the customers are even going to be interested in your product, right? Uh, which was the last question that we all answered here, right? That, uh, that we answered which was and that is what really an entrepreneur has to figure out. Is the market ready for my product? Is the market what needs to be done to develop the market, to change, to create the change in society, change for them to accept this new technology and um, by watching his video, uh, you will get a very good idea of um, you know, how it happened and then you know, he will also talk about what happened after Webvan and his career after Webvan has been amazingly successful. Uh, and what's amazing actually is that he recognized that Webvan was going to go under uh, six months before his CEO recognized it and he was on the board of directors where he told the CEO that you know you st we still have about 200 or 300 million dollars in the bank, uh, why don't we you know tell Wall Street that you know we are not ready to launch this web van in the big way that we are thinking of, the market is not ready, the technology needs to be fine tuned etc etc, the product strategy has to be changed a bit here, let's test it, we have two or three hundred million dollars left and uh, you know let's buy, uh, let's do it over the next three four years. So he goes into the board meeting and makes that proposal and essentially the CEO says look, I'm a CEO who came from Accenture which was a big, big company and he said that if I come here and I made commitments to Wall Street, you know, I'm going to deliver or I'm going to go bust. And so actually uh, Peter Raylan quit the next day and at that time the stock price was still high. So he took all his options, 
sold them the next day <laughs> immediately, made a fortune and uh, you know left the company. Uh, so uh, and what's interesting is that in his next company he just raised 10 million dollars, built it up nicely, took it, made it successful in three years and now as I told you last week he's a, running an incubator only for first time entrepreneurs straight out of college. He says I don't want anybody with preset, pre uh, you know fixed mindsets, I want people to, who think fresh and uh, so he takes these people and helps them create companies. He provides all the support structure needed for taking the technology and the innovation, innovative ideas of these young kids and he's got an amazing incubator that is successful in Silicon Valley. Okay, I'll just go to the slide. So Webvan, it was founded December 1997. They raised 10 million dollars but they targeted this massive market for online grocery delivery, right? And right now we've got so many startups in India like Grofers. I just saw some things from Grofers for online grocery delivery. There's a lot of these kinds of businesses, uh, pharmaceuticals delivery, medical delivery, all kinds of delivery companies are there. So, but this was 1997, you know, when the internet was just starting, right? So, he raised 10 million dollars and they targeted this massive market for online shopping and then delivering. And uh, he was the IIT Delhi IT guru, Peter Raylan, and then he had a strong founding team. Uh, Barnes and Noble founder and in two years he actually raised 400 million dollars of venture capital and then as soon as the product was almost ready even before he started shipping delivering product and he raised another 400 million dollars in an IPO. If you remember that time the internet was booming it was called the dot com boom which became the dot com bust right in two years it became the dot com bus. So in uh, Q4 of 99, you know, everybody was so excited about the potential for internet that he raised 400 million dollars and um, basically in March or April, he was, he went to the board and told everybody that, you know, looks like this company is not ready for the market or the market is not ready for the product and uh, it went bankrupt you know just in six months after that. So you can see that is really the case study for Webvan and um, if we go to I've, I've shared this uh, chapter one of the startup owners manual I've shared it on the portal. So you can just go to the startup owners manual click on that and you'll see that I've shared uh, four different uh, sections of uh, some chapters but uh, you can read uh, this story. So now you can actually read the story as it was analyzed by Steve Blank and then you can actually watch the video of Peter Raylan actually telling you what, what happened. And uh, you'll see that it's all because of um, the fact that small companies haven't re really figured out what we call the customer discovery process or the customer uh, development process which is figuring out you know what the customer needs are, what the product needs to be, what the you know and validating what the pricing should be, all the things how it should product should be delivered, you know how do you reach the customer, you know all the business model part of it has not been figured out and if you start building your company you hire 100 engineers, you hire marketing and sales, you start putting up factories uh, and, and different go downs and so on and you start buying all these trucks to deliver everything and you're not ready and the market is, consumer doesn't start ramping up at the same rate, obviously you'll run into massive losses, right? And so, so basically you can see that um, the big issue is jumping into execution mode uh, and company building before you know what the company is, business is all going to be. So essentially we talked last week 
about the fact that that startups have to actually go through a customer discovery and validating that particular need, right? So that is really what it's all about before you get into company building. So that big line between search and execution is really where you write your business plan. You don't start writing your business plan at the point that you came up with the idea. When you come up with the idea, you still have to go and start validating and prepare your BMC before you go ahead and start your company building process. And then we talked about all the customer development manifesto, all the 14 different points. And then uh, I want to talk about for about 5 minutes or 10 minutes about how customer discovery happens in the real world, right? So customer discovery is something that you're going to do all the time because as an entrepreneurial company you're continuously trying to figure out the answers, right? So uh, in uh, while I was with Selectica we had come up with brand new AI based technology to do you know product configuration. So when you have a complex telecom equipment or a complex computer system or a network you know how do you basically configure the new products that you want to that people can order, right? So, if you look at uh, uh, at who would be our potential customers, uh, I you know when we came up with the artificial in, uh, intelligence based configuration engine, we said you know Siemens that makes telco equipment would be a good customer. So, we had a great configuration engine. My CTO from IIT Kanpur, he had been he's a PhD, worked at Xerox Park. He wrote all the papers on configuration. He was a, kind of a genius in that AI space and uh, he's you know he'd been working for 10 or 15 years. So you know he had a fantastic configuration engine, rules engine. So we, I called up the Siemens CIO and I said you know hey we've got an amazing configurator based on the greatest uh, latest and greatest AI technology. So why don't we take a look at it because it's really going to help you configure your product. So we went there. We gave a demonstration of our configuration product and, and engine and he said and all his engineers were impressed because it was solving problems that they could not even imagine could be solved by configuration engine and at that point I said you know uh, hey you like the product are you interested in you know working with it using it and becoming a customer and he said oh there's no way I can use your product. And I said, why won't you use my product? You know, it solves all your configuration problems, you know, which you are having so much trouble solving. He said that, oh, right now, if I had to use your configuration engine for my equipment, I'm going to have to hire a hundred engineers who will have to take all the rules about my different telecom products, write Java programs in order to feed it into your configurator. Otherwise, your configurator cannot operate all the rules. So I'm not going to hire a hundred Java engineers to make, and then I'm going to have to, you know, maintain, you know, keep all these Java engineers and models maintained. So I come back and say that look, we may have the greatest configuration engine, but if we don't have an easy-to-use model builder, we nobody's going to buy our product. So these engineers had been working on it. My CTO had been working on this configuration engine for 15 years. We had another 30 engineers. They had been working on creating the greatest and most powerful engine for another two years. I said, okay, we've got to stop all that work because the engine is already quite good, but we have no model builder. So, but you know, these were great engineers. So they pivoted, changed direction, and um, they came up with a spec in record time and created something called a model builder. So you just type in your rules in ordinary English and boom, it generates all the Java code which would represent the rules and feed it into the engine. So three months later, I go back to the Siemens and say, look, I've got this amazing model builder and basically we took a two-year project and did it in three months. And so it's called agile development, right? So we did uh, agile development and uh, 
he was surprised that I was going to show him a model builder. But you know, I showed it to him again. He, he liked it. His engineers liked it, and I said, "Okay, now are you ready to buy?" And um, he says, "Oh, there's no way I can buy this." I said, "Why won't you buy it? You know, you are now it automatically does everything." He says, "You know, you expect me to take all the orders and automatically type it in? I'm going to hire a hundred. You know how many orders we get every day? I'm going to have a hundred data entry people to enter the orders into the." Uh, ERP system, SAP ERP system, and um, you know I could see his problem, right? So that's discovering the customer's problem, saying, "Yeah, we may have a great configuration engine, but nobody's going to buy it uh, for industrial purposes if it does not work with their manufacturing system." So I said, "Okay." I went back to the engineers and said, "You guys it's got a great model builder, but nobody's going to buy this." You know, so again we pivoted. So we took all these engineers who were experts with Java and model builder and everything. Said now you've got to become middleware engineers. How to integrate one major IT app with another? And uh, you know they are great engineers, so they pivoted again. And instead of being hard nosed about being C and Java engineers, they started learning middleware. And you know they were great engineers. They took another two year project. Shoved it into three months, and they seamlessly integrated the output of our uh, configurator straight into a SAP ERP system. You know, just zoop, it goes right in. Again, called up Siemens, told him, "Okay, we've already done this," and he couldn't believe it. But showed him everything; everything is working. And uh, we said, "Okay, now, are you willing to do business with us?" He says, "Oh, no way." <laughs> Because he said that you know, uh, with your system, I have no idea how many orders I'm getting. There's no report generator, and it's not an easy to use system for the salespeople to enter the orders. It does not generate a quote automatically. You take the order, but it has to generate a automated quote, right? And whenever we go to a shop, there's a quote. It does not generate quotes. It's not a doesn't you know? It's not a system that. Uh, you know, will work in the real world. So I go back to my engineer and say, "Okay, you've done all this. Now you guys go to go start writing a billing system and a report generating system and a business analytics application and all that." But you know, these thirty engineers were amazing engineers, and you know, so they stopped working on ERP integration and did this, and they got it all done. It's amazing. Uh, so they all came to. So we took it in. And now everything worked, right? We could build models. We could seamlessly take the order. We could generate reports. Said, okay, what about the order? And he said, you know, a year has gone by. I could not wait for you anymore. So I've given the million-dollar order to your competitor. You know, at that point, you know, uh, we were pretty sad. You know, you do everything and you don't get the order. So I said, you know. Uh, we don't get the order. I understand you've already given the order, but you know I've done all this work for you. Can I help you one more time? I can help you by telling you what problems you're going to face by using my competitor's product because I know they don't have a very good configuration engine. Because you know we knew we had the world's best configuration engine, and uh, he said, "Look, I've signed an NDA with." This other company, a non-disclosure agreement. I'm not going to share. I'm not going to. But he said that. But I pushed. So he said, "Okay, I'll let you actually sit next to an apps engineer and look at you know this engine of your competitor working, and you can tell, you can identify what the problems are that the apps engineer is going to, that you know uh, Siemens is going to face." So. You know, next week I go with my CTO and we put hard configuration problems fed into that uh, competitor's configurator, like nested models and you know all kinds of different syntaxes and everything, and fail, 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 fail. There were six major failures uh, in the core design of the competitor's configurator, and now we knew it. We knew the six major weaknesses. In the competitor's product, right? So, uh, you know, three months goes by. 
Now GE comes in with a big configuration order management order. GE makes you know MRI systems for scanning bodies etc. And these are 10 million dollar piece of equipment and they are very complex and they all need to be configured. So we go there and then we do a pilot and you know we, we do a perfect pilot because we have got front end, back end, report generating, everything is easy to use you know code generation everything is ready and you know so ultimately we did a good job and our competitor who won the Siemens order had done a good job and then suddenly you know we felt feeling pretty good and then the salesman calls us up calls me up and says oh they're given they're going to give the order to see uh, to Calico the competitor and I, I said uh, okay can you set up one meeting for me with the CIO, the guy who's going to give the order? So I fly to St. Louis and I say, okay, uh, you know, we've done all of this stuff and uh, let me explain to you a few things. Uh, he said that, look, both of you could do the job because, you know, they also had the system integration and everything done. And, but, you know, they have a reference at Siemens and the reference said that, you know, uh, he paid a million bucks to buy the software. So it must be something that is more reliable and more maintainable and everything else. So I said, um, let me tell you that, you know, the pilot you did was quite a simple pilot. So anybody can do it. But in the real life, you are going to need to configure products which are going to have all these complex rules. And that engine that you're trying to license from a competitor, is going to fail. He says, oh, I don't believe that. So he said, I said, let me tell you what the rules, tell, uh, let me give you all the information and your own engineers can check it out. And boom, they checked it out, fail, 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 because I knew, you know, where it would fail, right? And then essentially they called up Calico and Calico was shocked that, you know, somebody had discovered all their weaknesses, which were very deep hidden weaknesses and they never thought anybody could figure it out and, but they had found all the weaknesses and you know these deep engine problems are not easy to solve just like that. It would have taken them uh, two years to solve it and um, so GE had no option but to give us the order. So you can see that customer discovery enabled me to find everything that's needed to put to create a great software application, right? Which was not just something that is, you know, what my CTO who had worked for 15 years thought was an amazing technology, but it became a solution to an industrial problem, right? And uh, after that, I brought my entire sales team in and I said, look, here's the case study at GE and this is how you win. And if you ever lose to Calico again, you're fired <laughs> because we have the perfect product and we know the competitor inside out. We know his weaknesses. So you should never lose a single order. And believe it or not, we did not lose a single order to Calico. In fact, we took all their existing customers away from them. We went to Cisco and called up the CIO and said, look, I know you're facing all these problems. And he said, how do you know? I said, we know that you're facing all these problems and you should really take a look at our problem. So we signed a $10 million co contract with Cisco, with IBM, with, uh, and basically that's how we got a $5 billion valuation when we went public. So essentially customer discovery is, customer is the only person who can tell you how to take your brilliant insight or innovation and make it into a business. So you can't make a business, uh, you know, we could have sat in our offices and thought about, you know, oh, we should do this, we should do that, you know, but there's no way that we could figure out that a reporting system was fundamentally important. Something that generates a piece of paper gives, which gives the quote in the right format, you know, item one, item two, item three, you know, this product, this product, this product, list price, Quoted price, discount, you know, you guys have all seen what a coat looks like, right? Whenever you go shop, you know, to buy something. You, but those reports have to be generated. I mean, those forms have to be generated 
if you're going to build a product. And there's no way that we could have figured out that these reports were needed and if they were report needed, what format to put them in. So you can see that the customer discovery process really is fundamental to an entrepreneur's creating a product that the market will buy. You know, market will say, oh, great product, great technology, but they may not, they're not going to buy it till it satisfies their, their need, right? So what are the places that are there that an entrepreneur can get information from? Basically, entrepreneur needs information about how to take his technology and build everything around it in order to make it into a product. So one besides customers, which you must go, the second area is something called a RFQ. So all big companies, when they come up with a new purchase order for a whatever, whether it's building a bridge, building a new piece of equipment or, or a new software application, always have to do competitive bidding because and governments in particular have to do competitive bidding. When, you know, Prime Minister Modi released 1.25 lakh crores to in Bihar to build 300 bridges and 500 miles, every bridge is going to have an RFQ with it. People cannot say, okay, I'll give it to this person, the order. They cannot automatically give it to Larson and Tubro, the order, because Larson and Tubro is the biggest company building bridges. Larson and Tubro is going to have to write a proposal for each bridge, and each bridge, other competitors can also bid on it. And that all the information about the weight the bridge is supposed to have, how many years it's maintained, what the requirements are for stress and strain and this and that and carrying capacity and all of that is written in that document. And that RFQ from governments and big companies is really one of the best sources of information for an entrepreneur who wants to build this, build a product. So when you come up with a product that industry needs or government's uh, projects need, search on the internet for these RFPs and you know every RF, every state government, every city government, every medium small and large company is putting out these RFPs asking for competitive bids. So you've got all this tremendous access to information. Uh, it's not just products, it's also about market. You know, um, you know I had at Dino I had nine PhDs from Stanford University who had developed the world's next generation video streaming technology. And, uh, you know, automatically the venture capitalist said, oh, nine great PhDs from Stanford, here is five million dollars. No business plan, no nothing, just, you know, five million dollars, <laughs> just because these are nine brilliant uh, Stanford engineers. And everybody knew that video streaming on the internet was going to take over, be a massive market. So, you know, um, they built a great product, but you know, suddenly YouTube came along and everything was free. Justin TV, everything was free. Ustream, everything was free. And wherever we look, all this video on the internet was free. I mean, we just saw a video through Vimeo. Did any of us pay a single penny to watch it? Right now, we are doing HD video streaming of this class that uh, Shakti is uh, streaming out on YouTube and YouTube is not only streaming it to anybody who wants to watch it. And there can be 10,000 people. If I was a superstar like uh, Amitabh Bachchan, there would have been 10,000 people watching this. But, uh, uh, and YouTube basically did it for those kinds of people. But essentially, it's also open for us. It's a free streaming, live streaming service that uh, allows people to watch video on uh, cell phones, on laptops, on, um, on, 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 on their TVs, they can watch it everywhere, right? So essentially when we started marketing this new technology, we couldn't find anybody who's willing to pay for it. Now as an, I don't have two billion dollars to invest in developing a market like Google did for YouTube. Right now, 
after 10 years of investing $2 billion, YouTube is a very, very profitable company for our, set, our division for Google, right? Because, you know, everybody watches Google all the, t uh, YouTube all the time and they just hit you with those ads, you know. Uh, but I didn't have $2 billion to, you know, get so much usage of my product. So, basically, for three years I was looking for the market. I started streaming Chinmaya Mission from Pauai <laughs> to all their devotees. I went to churches. Uh, putting all the stuff everywhere. I went to marriages. I did uh, Miss California beauty contest. I did all kinds of things. You know, I did uh, video games like Xpire and all that, World of Warcraft. But you couldn't make money. I could not find a business model that would work for what we thought was one of the world's best video streaming platforms. And uh, then three years into the company, you know, we're trying to figure out what to do. And this guy from Cochin calls me up, calls up my number at home. And I start talking to him on Saturday afternoon and he says, you know, uh, I think we've got about almost 250,000, two and a half lakh Malayalis who leave Kerala and go all over the world. You know, Kerala nurses go to the Middle East, a lot of Kerala engineers go to uh, UK and US and A Africa and, you know, they all want to watch Asianet and they all want to watch Kairali, <laughs> you know, sitting, sitting in their foreign countries. And uh, I've tried out your software and he said, you know, it works really well. So, can you uh, help me stream 17 TV channels? from Cochin to, you know, all these Malayalis all over the world. So I said, how much will these guys pay? He said that, you know, we should be able to charge $20 a month. I have to pay AsiaNet and Kairali and all of these guys put together, the 17 channels, I have to pay about $8 and it's going to, I'd like to keep $7 for my expenses and my profit and everything else and I'll give you $5. So I said five dollars times, even if I get a one lakh Malayalis to subscribe to the service, that's like, you know, half a million dollars a month multiplied by 12 months, it's six million dollars and then there's another couple of hundred thousand Telugus, another whole bunch of Punjabis, Bengalis, Odisha, Turkish people, Kenyan people, Croatian people, Nigerians, Kenyans, whatever. And I said, there's a significant multi-hundred million dollar diaspora all over the world that would like to watch TV channels from their home country. And I said, you know, very soon I can be, uh, if I just get to a hundred thousand users, viewers, uh, I can get to, you know, uh, a significant uh, business that, you know, once I ramp up to a million, I'm a $60 million business, if I ramp up to 10 million, which is just 10% of the $100 million diaspora, I'm like a $600 million revenue company, which will be worth tens of billions of dollars, right? And um, so I go back to my team and I say, you guys are great PhDs doing all kinds of you know, optimization of encoding and decoding and streaming and security on video. But I need to have a customer billing system on this, on this thing. Like Tata Sky has got a billing system, right? You can go to uh, My Tata Sky and you can go ahead and decide which channels you want and how much you want to uh, subscribe and, you know, they allow you to cancel and add and all of those things and put packages and everything. So I need you to put that kind of a billing system and customer acquisition system together. And again, you know, if you have good engineers and you sh share all their, and you get their buy-in that this is worth going after, they'll give up all their AI work and all their other work and they'll write a billing system for you. You know, so in three months, you know, we had a phenomenal customer acquisition and billing system 
and we suddenly became a TV streaming online TV streaming company and after that we visited Turkey I got all the 40 top ch Turkish channels and Nigerian channels and six months I had 600 TV channels and I was just and you know we had quickly we ramped up to over 10,000 users and money started coming in and so on so you can see that market discovery does not happen if by sitting in the office you have to go out find somebody who might need your product and um, then you can go ahead and build your company and then the last thing is competition you have you know if you just try to understand the competition by going to their website and by reading their documents their marketing documents you'll pretty much get zero out of it in fact you're probably more likely to be depressed and get out of your own business you may have the greatest product but you read your competition's material and you're going to be depressed because you know obviously the marketing guys you know are going to write out that they can do everything right but in reality everybody has bugs everybody has some problem or the other so the question is like you know to discover them and then use them at the right time in order to uh, you know convert that extra knowledge about the competitors weakness into business right so essentially the ways you get uh, customer uh, competitive information is strategic customer partnership which is what I did with Siemens and uh, the second thing is hiring from the competition so competitive hiring like you know of their engineers of their marketing people of their sales people is the least expensive way to get your hands on everything that the customer is your competition has a problem Obviously, they're going. They're using the same strategy against you, so uh, that's life, right? So the thing is that you know, if you, if they are, they've got competitive in information about you, and you don't have about them, then you ain't going to be successful in the marketplace. So competition discovery is absolutely fundamental to succeeding in the marketplace. So these are some real world customer discovery and uh, you can't be shy about it you've got to be aggressive about it and that's the only way that uh, customer discovery happens so moving on to the webvan case you can see that the problem for web webvan was not doing customer discovery in in the right time frame so they assumed that online ordering and online delivery it's such a fantastic idea. Remember, this is 1997, 18 years ago, that you know automatically everybody's got to have it. Why drive to a sh to a shop to look for something, put in a cart, bring it, and you know carry it all the way home? When you know you just go to the web, your choices are hundredfold more because you know virtual store is going to have, be have hundredfold more product and then you can just do it so they assume that they know what the customer wants uh, they know how to get the customer to use your product and then you know they want to just get the job done they want to be first out of the door they just want to get the job done so they're not they don't care about you know understanding how to do it right but they just want to get it done so they focus on the launch date and when you focus on the launch date now you're building your company so obviously in order to build as you'll see from the video build the web van thing they actually had to build one of the most sophisticated uh, warehouses with the automated robotic system that would pick up tomatoes without smashing them pick up eggs without sh smashing them pick up water uh, milk without you know knowing the date of the expiry date of the milk and getting it at the right time packing it all properly so that the tomatoes don't get put under the heavy you know milk jar and all that uh, so all uh, you know uh, so basically they had to basically design uh, intelligent warehouse 
with robotics and conveyor belts and all that and they thought that they'll be getting about 10,000 orders or 100,000 orders per day and they had to scale up to having a warehouse that can pack, put everything, organize it by city, by delivery, by truck and automatically get it there so that boom it goes out, right. So the whole thing was an automated system. So they wrote the software, they designed the hardware, they put the conveyor belt system and whipped it out in a year and a half. And you'll see from Peter Raylan's uh, explanation, it, they worked night and day guys. The whole team worked night and day to deliver this amazing automated grocery picking, dropping, you know, picking, packaging, shipping system and, uh, and uh, you know, they had to hit revenue targets uh, instead of as soon as one factory looked like it was ready to work, they bought land in eight other different big cities, Chicago, New York, Dallas, uh, Miami, everywhere and started building eight more factories. So the pro, you know, the system and the bugs are still being debugged. In the meantime, they're already building factories and ordering equipment and everything and servers and uh, conveyor belts and everything for eight different factories. So hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars are now being spent uh, for all these factories without getting a single order, right? And you can see that the presumption of success is really what led to wiping out 800 million dollars of investment in three years. They presumed that, you know, they were going to be successful and that presumption of success is really which led to premature scaling and ultimately let it go. And as uh, Raylan saw in the last meeting, board meeting that he attended, that he actually went and told the CEO that, look, maybe we should tell Wall Street and back off from our targets and give ourselves another two years. Let's just get one factory up, let's develop the customer base and then we'll get the other factories going. And, and you know, with him, ego coming in the way, it ultimately led to bankruptcy by the end of 2000. Now, what's interesting is that online grocery delivery has become a successful business, right? It has actually become successful 15 years later and actually two of his competitors that started with very little money but went about it systematically have now become multi-billion dollar companies even in the US and in the India also there are many uh, grocery delivery startups coming. So essentially you can see that you know the key difference, yes. So is there a the last few months. In, in reality, you cannot because what happens is that you made commitments to, uh, you know, real estate people because you bought all this land, you, you, you've taken loans from banks to buy the land to get the money to build the factories, to build the land. I mean, you started, made, you made so many financial commitments, you've ordered equipment that might have a lead time of say, three months, six months, right? These are all custom equipment for their big conveyor belts and everything else. They bought probably hundreds of thousands of delivery vans. You can't tell GM that, okay, I don't want your van. Then there's a penalty clause, which is going to kill you anyway, right? So, so essentially once, you start rolling very hard to, it's like the Titanic, right? The Titanic did hit the... Well, actually you can pivot, but what happens is that then the human uh, ego comes in the way. So, yes, they still had several hundred million dollars in the bank. So you're right in one way that, you know, the CEO, if he had any sense, uh, and he was a, he's a brilliant guy, the CEO is a very famous CEO, 
And if that CEO had gone ahead and taken responsibility to save the shareholders money or investors money and said, look, the real fact is it's, we can't deliver. And you're going to have to shut this thing down till we solve all the problems. But uh, mostly it's hard to stop it. So people actually will take the company to bankruptcy just to get it right. Just so that they are right. No, no, you can probably pivot till any time. But the thing is, so, but as an entrepreneur, you're probably going to be more honest and be willing to pivot. Corporate giants find it very hard to pivot. Corporate giants will go into bankruptcy rather than pivot. Like Nokia, do you think it's a good example of a company that did not pivot? You know, they stuck with Symbian till they died. <laughs> till the day they died, they did not pivot. Did most of us think that they should have switched to Android three years ago, two years ago? Even a year ago, they would have saved themselves. I mean, you saw Nokia die in front of you in the last, and we are all users of Nokia till two years ago. So you can see big companies find it very hard to accept their errors, you know. All the engineers only know Simeon. All the retail people have so much stock. And if you tell them that now we are going to start offering Android Nokia phones. Uh, you can see Microsoft, you know, also suffering uh, because Steve Ballmer, once he had made a certain decision, he cannot pivot. So only by getting rid of that CEO, the company can actually pivot. So the pivot sometimes in a big company actually requires you to do something pretty drastic, which is get rid of the CEO, get rid of the management, you know, bring in brand new management, then you pivot. So a lot of companies have been saved from basic bankruptcy by changing the management. Even in India, there are lots of such cases, right? Where uh, essentially pivoting happened because drastic change had, um, was made to the top management. Yeah. So, so basically, if you look at this, uh, this, yeah. So, so in the case where uh, you did not actually get into bankruptcy, but it was a good model and was going well. So, in that scenario, how do you figure out when you should exit? Them? For example, say Rectica, you saying it was going very well. Yeah. So, uh, how do you decide if this is the point where I need to exit and somebody else needs to step out? Well, what happened for Selectica, if you look at it, you know, we were doing very well. And then the dot-com bust happened and the telecom bust happened in 2001. So 90% of our order book disappeared because all the telecom companies stopped buying any software, any hardware because they themselves were crashing and burning. So they killed all the orders that they had with all their vendors and for three years they didn't buy anything. So my business that had gone to 50 million and I was projecting it to get to 150 million in one year ended up going down to 40 million. So actually shrunk by 10 million dollars. So when it shrank by 10 million dollars the board said okay we understand you know and, you know, I tried to do other things like buying some other companies, insurance business and all that. And we kept the business going, but it still shrank to 30 million the next year. At that point, the board said, you know, uh, why don't we try some other management? And, you know, then, they, then you say, okay, it's your decision, right? The board can decide to bring in a new CEO. So they brought in a new CEO, but basically like, you know, very hard for the new CEO to, you know, understand, you know, how you had built the company in the first place. So they tried something new like contract management and all that, but that really didn't do particularly well. 
but still now the company is basically a contract management company all that configuration technology that we have developed they are not getting any more customers because they just don't know how to market how to sell against the competition whatever and even though configuration now has become pretty big business Selectica has got no position in the configuration market because you know they lost the understanding of the market and the business right. So what happens is that in corporations, startups you know a lot of it uh, can actually depend on personality also you know the person's capabilities etc. Anyway, so let's uh, look at the difference between uh, search and execution. Search is what an entrepreneur does. Execution is what you know existing company does. So, in the strategy phase, when you're trying to figure out what to do, an entrepreneurial company does business model hypothesis. You say, what about this? What about this? What about this market segment? While uh, existing company is really focused on how to improve the operating results, the financial results, the market share, etc. If you look at the process in which uh, the company is built and the products are built, in one case you are doing customer development which is discovery and validation, right. In the other case you are doing product management, how to add one more feature, how to add one more uh, drop the manufacturing cost or whatever. The organization is very much founder driven, in the other case it is driven by all the different department heads that you got, you got a VP for product management, VP for engineering, VP for this, VP for that, so they are basically driving the company and essentially if you look at the capabilities of the entrepreneurial team it is totally different than the capabilities of the you know uh, 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 of the existing company all the big companies that we know of they are all got you know uh, human resources people, accounting people, operations people, marketing people, manufacturing people and so the only way to learn entrepreneurship is to actually do it and that is why like you know all of you are working on these business models and so on for developing your ideas right. So without doing you are not going to be able to really develop. So now uh, you know we are going to uh, take a look at you know the BMCs that I think we did not do we only did four or five BMCs. So I would like to have the people whose BMCs were not done come and uh, talk about the BMCs. Okay, so our project, uh, like our business plan, is basically regarding the energy monitoring system. So, uh, what our idea is in the beginning. Okay. So, what we are trying to do is we are trying to develop a device which will actually enable the people to monitor what exactly individual appliances in the home is contributing to the total electricity bill. For example, if you have so many lights in the Classroom. So, one particular light, how much amount of like how many rupees does it contribute to the total monthly electricity bill? And let's say if you have two similar lights, you can also monitor what kind of like which light is using more power, which is providing more uh, like cost on your monthly resources. So these are all easily possible using this device. And the main purpose of this device is to be like very small so that you can actually retrofit it in your present like existing switchboards. You need not buy a complete switchboard to use this thing and you need not even pay a huge amount to like use this kind of thing. So the value propositions I will come is like when you use this product you actually get to know where you are wasting energy. So for example you have your laptops, you have your computers at your home, you have the geezers. So all these things they can be used optimally but we majorly tend to keep it on standby. Uh, we go for a path let's say for one hour. But once we get a knowledge about how much we are actually using the energy and how much our usage is uh, reflecting on the total monthly expenditure. So that kind of knowledge when, when we get it, so people can actually get to know where they are wasting the energy. So that is one thing and once you get to know where we are wasting the energy, obviously you have an opportunity to save the energy also. 
Okay. And uh, then uh, we also have a plan like uh, this particular device which we are making will be like there will be a one transmitter device, let's say in the switch boards, one receiver central device for one particular board, complete board, there will be one receiver device which will connect to all the transmitter devices in the switch boards in your home and that one particular trans uh, receiver device can transfer your database through a, let's say a mobile application. Uh, so it can actually create a social uh, awareness about, for example, I have my application app, let's say I save 300 rupees of electricity bill, where, like comparative to my previous electricity bill. And this I got to know, and I can even share it on Facebook, let's say if we start a social awareness, something like that. So uh, people can actually share that we have saved this much of energy and people can actually encourage others to save similar amount of energy or let's say will create social awareness about efficient usage of energy. Okay. Uh, so the main activities will be like the consumption details, like uh, people will get to know the consumption, de uh, consumption details and uh, the next part which we can do is, for example, once the company start making, uh, presently we have a standard of, let's say, uh, the star rating, energy star rating is the standard for all the appliances. Like, uh, we provide a 3 star uh, appliance or we have a 5 star appliance. So, people can actually move from the star rating to like monthly uh, electricity consumption or monthly impact on your bills. So, those can also be like, a company can actually start advertising that, this uh, our uh, I, we can save a hundred rupee on the electricity monthly bill compared to our competitors. So those kind of things are also possible. And uh, apart from this, coming to the uh, key resources, so there will be one monitoring platform which we will have to develop. And then uh, the th things are like people will get to know about the consumption trends completely, like what kind of and for example, it's one week down the month. So you can actually extrapolate your usage and get a monthly estimate of what your bill is going to be or for example there are seasonal variations like the appliance usage depend on the season also. Mm -hmm. So those all things can also be tracked down and like you can estimate what kind of usage you are going to go about and all those things. And uh, going to the customer relations. So this product is like one time installation product so there won't be multiple uh, interaction with the process, uh, customers. So we will try to automate the process as, uh, as, uh, like, as much as possible. For example, as I said, mentioned the application, mobile application. All those things like automatic updates now. And uh, for example, if if there is a case in which we can have a contract with the government, because presently the MSCB boards have the uh, electricity meter. So if we kind of get like uh, government people to, uh, let's say, make this as a standard, like everybody can use it and uh, like, this is presently at the device level, uh, but if it goes to home levels, we can actually standardize because the present meters they give only like a complete usage of your uh, electricity. But uh, for example, if make it standard, it can be like a particular advance. Let's say a fan should not impart more than this amount of energy in your electricity. If it is, so it has to be replaced. Something kind of these things are also possible. And uh, next is like long term, yeah, that is like long term contracts with government. That was and uh, the uh, channels through which we can actually public uh, publicize this product is like through television advertisements, uh, offline media obviously like uh, door to door marketing also and uh, sales team is obviously easy. Uh, coming to the customer <coughs> segments, uh, the customers who we can target is literally every family, everybody like if not the very higher upper class, at least the middle, family, middle class people will actually want to save energy wherever it is possible. If not the energy, at least the monthly electricity bill. So that will actually bring them up to use this particular product. <coughs> Apart from that, a complete society and uh, societies uh, can also use it. For example, a uh, society has some kind of uh, public usage area. So those can also be monitored. Okay, I think let's ask some questions, guys. Um, so who thinks this is going to be a successful company is this a is this going to be a successful company given the bmc right now yeah so energy conservation energy saving money you know is it's always a good idea so so the question really is you know 
for these kinds of products, where are the challenges? What is the challenge a company that is trying to save money in a mass market? It's a mass market. So when you have a mass market, where are the problems going to come from for the entrepreneur? What about the initial investment that people should make? So initial investment, insulation issues, um, what else? I think the biggest challenge in mass market is that there are big corporations who want to enter. Not like the long tail. It's like Google might Nest might come. No, Nest actually was an entrepreneurial startup, and it entered a market that Honeywell and others were dominating for 50 years. And everybody thought that there was people will only spend twenty dollars in that temperature controller, but Nest went ahead and made a very sexy looking thermostat, made it very easy to easy to swap out that existing thermostat, and they made it something that is smartphone compatible because they provided a Nest app on your smartphone, and they charged uh, trolley because I installed you know, three nests in my house uh, because I have three different thermostats for three different areas in my house and uh, I paid like, you know, 199 for each device. So something that was already working in my house, I paid $199 to swap out something that was already there because, you know, uh, Nest gave me all the reasons to convince me that this energy ma uh, improvement system would be nice to have for my house. So the ch question that I have is that you, s you know Nest's strategy. So you already have an example of one strategy that works in a mass market. But you can see that Nest did not replace the commodity market. Nest actually replaced own the targeted the market that maybe should be for everybody but they targeted a market that was appealing to a certain kind of consumer somebody who can who's aware of the need for saving energy who wants to take the big picture that if i make a 199 dollar investment i can in two years i can recover my money so I had the ability to wait for two years to recover my money. So, so Nest actually targeted a very small niche portion of the market. You know, the kind of the uh, more intelligent, more cost insensitive, uh, somebody who wants to uh, create a message of doing energy conservation, you know, kind of a aware consumer, but that's, a small market, 0.01% of the market, but uh, that's why they charge so much money so that even with 0.01% of the market, they could sell a lot of Nest devices, make it profitable, and in the end, you know, Google had to pay $3 billion to buy Nest out, even though Nest revenue must have only been about 100 or $200 million. Because, you know, Google saw the opportunity for every family. So Google wants to go and be in every house. And they saw that Nest had a product and they said, you know, if I put all the Google marketing behind it, if I add security and I add all these other features into that Nest device, then it can become the de facto home monitoring system for energy, security, ta da 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 So Google loved the vision of Nest in order to pay $3 billion for that company. So the challenge for somebody going into a mass market is to avoid the temptation of addressing the mass market. No, you address the mass market and you try to compete with people who are selling you know 50 rupees switches 
that something that's going to cost you probably 200 rupees or 500 rupees or 1000 rupees, you can never compete, right? And the majority of the people, for them, you know, they'd rather have a 20 rupee switch than put in a 1000 rupee switch. So, you know, when you address a mass market, you have to take the long tail approach. You think Chiki Chunk could have entered the umbrella market with another black umbrella? No matter, you know, everything else. I mean, he had to address it with something that addressed 0.0001% and that to a very specific target customer and then, you know, appeal to them with design. So, very important message for the entrepreneur is that, you know, entrepreneurs cannot go after commodity mass markets uh, head on. In five years or ten years, you know, the intelligent uh, energy conservation device will probably replace every home. But, you know, an entrepreneur can have that vision, but you cannot start with that. You know, you still need to enter the market with something brilliant and a long tail strategy, right? So, you need to take your BMC and figure out what is the long tail market that you can go after given your unique ability to develop some technology. You're an IT engineer, you've got resources in all these departments, you can develop any kind of device that, uh, you know, might actually use some late great technology that the mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, chemical engineering department might have developed in order to come up with a solution that will give you a foot in the energy conservation market. Make sense? Okay. I think we've got time for one more. Anybody ready? Okay. So, the main uh, assignment for this week is to actually go ahead and have you talk to five or ten real customers. As you can see from today's discussion, uh, if you guys don't actually, you know, review your BMCs with uh, people like me or Professor Kusre, uh, you're going to actually end up uh, not focusing your BMC activity in the right direction. You know, if you just have a BMC like that, we know that company has got zero chance of succeeding. You see what I'm saying? So, if, a, if after this course you have a company that has got zero chance of succeeding, then it's very hard to, you know, mean that you know what entrepreneurship is, right? So, you guys really need to uh, come and connect with uh, me or with Professor Kusre and, uh, you know, discuss with uh, people who are in this entrepreneurship business, you know, and you can find your own, uh, you can run it by other entrepreneurs too. Uh, that people have already done it to figure out, you know, how to create an entrepreneurial initiative in any different market segment. All the market segments that you guys are addressing are wonderful market segments, but you have to figure out that one little niche approach, unique approach that will allow you to build your first product successfully and get your foot in the door in that market. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you.